What have I always said about hot stuff? Lightsabers would explode you. Phasers would explode you. Falling into lava would be really bad and kind of explode you. Oh, look at the recent study on Mount Vesuvius. What really happened to the people at Pompeii. Well, scientists ran some simulations and did some studies, and they found that the lava, given how quickly it covered the people of Pompeii, would cause their blood to boil and create enough steam that their skulls would explode because their brains would turn into mush bombs, cortical concussion grenades, if you will. So, it's good to be right. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections and address them directly. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, that's all you need to know. But first, on last week's episode, we went back to the unofficial You Don't Want X Superpower series, this time teleportation. I said that if you evaluate teleportation scientifically, because so much of it is undefined, if you apply it to our world and our universe, it could be horrifically dangerous. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Samuel Patterson and others who say something about, well, wouldn't teleporting into a location or away from a location create a vacuum that would cause some sort of concussion or shockwave that would be very dangerous to Nightcrawler, or wouldn't he phase into or fuse with the air molecules that he was trying to displace? Well, if we're talking about Nightcrawler, at least he has a way to deal with the potential pop in, pop out vacuums that he is creating. Canonically, Nightcrawler is traveling to a brimstone smells like a fart dimension and then to another location. Now, how I always interpreted this, because people in the comics can smell brimstone after Nightcrawler travels, it's that some air from the brimstone dimension is coming into our atmosphere wherever he is appearing. So imagine opening up like a Ziploc bag filled with normal atmospheric pressure air into our atmosphere. It'd be like opening the door to another dimension, right? kind of, so you open the bag and and nothing. Because the pressures are the same and there's still air there, there's not a rush of air into or out of that space that would create a shock wave like you are saying. So maybe Nightcrawler can get around this potential problem. If he didn't and you were just creating vacuums because you were just straight up teleporting places, yes, teleporting into air molecules would probably be pretty bad for your body and teleporting out of an area would create some kind of shock wave. But from estimations that I've done and that some of you have done in the comments, I do not think those shock waves would be all that dangerous. Definitely not blowing people up levels. So, our next comment comes from Sniperboy23 and Oxypognip, who say, well, if you had a teleporter like in Star Trek, would that be different? And when thinking about this for the teleporter episode, there is actually a problem with Star Trek style teleportation, but it depends. So if you are beaming down someone to the surface of a planet and they're not appearing instantaneously, it takes a few moments for the beaming down to happen, then some atoms, some material of that person are appearing before the rest of them. And if that spaceship that is beaming the person down isn't traveling with the rotation of the planet in a geosynchronous orbit, as Oxypognip suggests, then some of that person would be rotated away as some of the other bits of the person are deposited, and you would end up like a spaghettified person, but by science and that would be bad. One way to get around this problem, which Star Trek also has, is the local transporter. So if you have a room where someone is teleporting to, then uh, if you're on a spaceship, stationary, and you wanna get down to a planet, if you are teleporting into a room on the planet that is already spinning at some velocity, you are arriving at that velocity, and then you are fine. You don't have this weird turned into something as wispy as Captain Picard's hair on arrival, which is to say, a dead. Our next comment comes from Sterling Marsh and Primal Edge and others who say, what about Doctor Strange portals and portal portals? Are those different? Well, yes, I think Doctor Strange portal and portal portals would be different because when you are arriving at the location, you're already there. I know it sounds kind of trippy, but if you're connecting two places in space, they are already in sync with each other, kind of. Imagine like uh, sending, shooting, uh, using the portal gun and shooting out a portal all the way to a plane that's passing by in the sky. Now, if you put a portal in the ground and then you step through it, you're already on the plane. You don't have to speed up to match the plane's velocity. You are 
already going because the portal itself, which you are traveling through, is traveling with the plane already at that velocity. So when you arrive there, you're there. So that kind of works, and it's the same with Doctor Strange. The problem with Nightcrawler's version is that he is removing himself from reality, having to travel in some dimension somehow, and then pick a place and then appear there. That is different because where you are appearing is not already matching the local velocity and the conditions of where you want to be. So yes, Doctor Strange's portals would be different and portal portals would also be probably okay. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to the real Everton who says, you need to look up the Canadian hero Vindicator from Alpha Flight, Wolverine's old team. He had a science version of what you mentioned. He would essentially remove himself from being bound to the planet for a second or something and come back in a thousand miles away. I'm sorry, it's a bit vague, man. It was almost 30 years ago. All right, I had never heard of this superhero until now. This is Guardian who has a cool suit who later gave that suit to Vindicator. And this suit allowed Guardian to lock himself into uh, stationary coordinates on the Earth and then very scientifically, like we're saying, he let the Earth rotate beneath him so that when he popped back in, he would have traveled a thousand miles per hour in that time. So he was using the scientific version of what we're talking about, locking himself in a stationary point and letting the Earth's rotation do the work for him. Of course, he could only go really fast to the West, but it was still very cool. And he would have to deal with supersonic winds and stuff flying at him when he arrived there, but letting the Earth do the work for you, accounting for the rotation of the Earth, and incorporating the 1,000 miles per hour rotational velocity into a superhero is exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why you are the real Everton, a super nerd. But of course, I'm not always right. I continuously misspell because you think that I wouldn't by this point. So what did I get wrong last week? So our first correction, the biggest correction, comes from Arthur E. King, 8472, 8471 was taken, and others who say, well, what are you actually talking about, Kyle, dude? Are you talking about teleporting relative to the Earth, relative to the Sun, relative to the Milky Way, relative to the galactic core, relative to all the other galaxies, relative to the super cluster with that Hawaiian name? Lenny Akea? I don't know. It depends. This is the problem. This is what we we're talking about. Your correction is valid because I said that the Earth is going around the sun very, very quickly, and if you don't account for that, you could be left in the dust, or better yet, in the vacuum of space, totally dying. But if you consider the Earth and the sun going around another point in space, that speed could be increased by orders of magnitude, and then it's even more of a problem. All of this is unaccounted for by teleportation. None of it is ever specified. It's not saying what point in space you are choosing, how it works, how you do it, where the dimension is, blah, 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 blah. That is my problem with it. If it is not specified, then it is very hard to evaluate. And I, and this show, are not willing to say that teleportation as a superpower just deals with that. That's not good enough. I like to have things that are at least somewhat grounded in the universe. Bend a few rules, but do not break everything. Otherwise, what do we learn? Nothing. So, I think teleportation needs to be a lot more specified, and in your corrections, you're correct. There's even more to worry about. Our next correction comes from the 213th person to have the Sango Productions handle, who says, hmm, okay, slightly disappointing. I think you mean cringy. It is typically assumed that this stuff is just accounted for when teleporting. Sort of like you don't need to take out a calculator when treading carpet and ice. I don't agree. Do you not take out a calculator when treading ice? I do. I like to know how many rotations degree-wise my triple sow cow is. Also, would inheriting your momentum before and after the jump not just move you with the planet? All right, so I thought about this. If you are traveling with the Earth at some velocity, you know, 30 kilometers per second around the sun, and you teleported and you kept that velocity, wouldn't you just end up on the planet just fine still? Well, again, I think it depends. Think of it this way. Imagine you were standing on top of a car that was going around a racetrack, and you were standing on top of the car, and the car was going, and it has a slight curve, like their Earth's orbit, and then you were going, and then you teleported out, and then, because you have the same velocity, you teleported back in. Now, at this point, the direction of your velocity is going to be slightly different than the direction 
of the car's velocity. It is going around a curve, but as you go around the curve, your tangential velocity is a straight line. It is not a curve. So as you uh, reappear back on the Earth, it might be slightly mismatched. And because the numbers and the velocities we're talking about are so big, that slight mismatch could lead to large problems. That's what I think, unless you are still disappointed and then what can I do? Our next correction comes from Jen Lamont, who says, as I'm sure you know, Kyle, you're misusing the term dimension here. It's not your fault entirely, thanks. Since X-Men, Stranger Things, Justice League, and just about every other fictional universe uses this way, but dimension is a thing's magnitude in a particular direction. Nightcrawler doesn't travel to a different measurement, obviously. What he travels to is another realm or pocket universe, not a dimension. And you're totally right. Okay, so what if someone traveled to the fourth dimension, a dimension other than our own? They wouldn't be three-dimensional anymore. So it's not like entering a brimstone dimension where Nightcrawler looks the same and there's a bunch of fart gas around. The fourth dimension, for example, would have to be a dimension that is at right angles to every degree of dimensionality we have here. So try to imagine a space at a right angle to forwards, backwards, left, right, up and down simultaneously. Oh, can you not? That's because no one can. We have no idea what it would look like. It's, a, it's an abstract mathematical concept that's almost too difficult for our minds to process. I cannot visualize what the fourth dimension would look like. It would not look like just a pocket universe or other universe like we always see it in popular culture. So you are right, Jen Lamont. Dimension isn't really the right term here. It is not even like a wormhole. It is like opening up a portal to another universe, stepping into it, and then back into ours. Your pet peeve is warranted. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Robert Short, who says a lot. But basically, he works through the math and says that if you were displacing air and creating vacuums like a lot of you said Nightcrawler would do, then it would be like suddenly being 33 feet underwater for a split second if he appeared next to you because of the pressure wave that would be created by the displaced air. That's cool enough, I could have said it. <laughs> Jeez. And for that, you are indeed a super nerd. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, <laughs> <laughs> you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be because you saw it two days earlier than everyone else. Yeah, huh? But if you haven't subscribed to Project Alpha just yet for premium content, the next episode of Because Science is going to be One Punch! More specifically, how many mosquitoes would it take to defeat One Punch Man? Yep. For real. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I am evaluating one of my favorite recent anime, One Punch Man, and a scene in that anime where a demon mosquito lady controls swarms of mosquitoes to suck entire people dry, drain all of their blood. How many mosquitoes would it take to do that? How long would it take? Is it even possible? Can you fit that many mosquitoes on your face? I answer all of those questions and more. Stay tuned. So, go watch the latest episode of Because Science, all about teleportation and why you don't want it. If you haven't yet, leave me all of your best and nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Ooh. He's got some weights to him. Sign up for Alpha right now and check out the new show, Orbital Redux. It stars the voice of Spider-Man himself, Yuri Lowenthal, in the world's first live interactive science fiction show. The first episode is free on Nerdist YouTube right now, but if you want to get in on the live action, you need to sign up for Alpha. If you check out last week's episode, you can even see me on the post show talking about all the cool wonders of the cosmos. You can get a free 60-day trial to Project Alpha right now by going to projectalpha.com and using the promo code ORBITAL. And don't forget, dance like everyone is watching, love like you have been hurt before, and work like you do need the money. Wisdom and experience and learning and growing from it is much more valuable to you as a person and your character than some fleeting feeling of hallmark happiness. I should put that in a card.